en la maha, en la reo, en la karangatanga maha, tena koto katoa. Ko Serena Kelly, aho. No mai hadamai kite fare tawahi amahi i aotearoa. Welcome. I wish, to warm, I wish to a warm welcome to this New Zealand Institute of International Affairs event, including to our members and non-members alike. I also welcome those who are joining us online via Zoom. I'm Serena Kelly. I'm a national board member of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, and I'm also a lecturer in European politics at the University of Canterbury and vice president of the European Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand. It's a pleasure to be your chair this evening. The New Zealand Institute of International Affairs is an independent organisation fostering understanding and discussion of international affairs, especially re relating to Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, it's a really important moment for us um, this evening to, with some of the recent milestones in the New Zealand-European Union European Union relationship and I'm sure we're going to hear some um, important um, information from Nina. It's a privilege to be, to be addressed this evening by Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer. She's been ambassador to New Zealand since 2019. Before she was in New Zealand, she held a number of important roles, including um, she was the advisor to the, chief dep to the deputy chief negotiator for the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, she was lead negotiator for issues relating to Ireland and Northern Ireland and deputy head of division in charge of EU relations and negotiation with Switzerland. And prior to joining the commission, she was a journalist with ARD, uh, television in Germany, and has degrees from Germany, Poland, and the United Kingdom. And I believe it's four languages. Six. Six, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Nina, I should know that by now. <laughs> the ambassador's address is followed by some reflective remarks from Mike Burrell. He is an executive director of the Sustainable Business Council. Prior to that role, he was New Zealand's High Commissioner to South Africa, and he's also been Director for Sustainable Economic Development at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and founding CEO of Aquaculture New Zealand. Following Mike's comments, uh, we'll have some time for some discussion and questions for Nina, so feel free to, to um, think about those. And afterwards, you'll see, you would have seen as you walked in that we've got some nibbles and drinks out in the foyer, so you're all welcome to join us then. So without further delay, I invite uh, Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer. Now making you. E ngā mana tike tike rauranga tirama, tenei aku mihi nui ki a koto i runga i tenei kaupapa nui i whakahuhui nei a tato. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, distinguished guests, good evening. Ki te mana whenua o tenei roe, ko te atiawa me taranaki whanui. Kei te mihi ki a koto, New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, um, and Director Hamish McDougall for welcoming me to speak this evening and of course to Sir Dr. Serena Kelly, um, expert in European affairs. Kate Mee Kiakwe, um, Mike Burrell, Executive Director of the Sustainable Business Council for moderating this evening. And many thanks to all of you for your interest in the European Union and Aotearoa New Zealand. When I arrived in Aotearoa New Zealand three years ago, the new EU leadership of Ursula von der Leyen, the first woman president of the European Commission, was just about to take office. Brexit seemed to be almost behind us, and what was hoped to be the last year of the Trump administration about to begin. The priorities for my work here were clearly cut out. And actually, and maybe a bit surprisingly, despite the many unexpected developments over the last years, they have not changed. Four. Four priorities for my work here. To build on the excellent partnership established with Aotearoa New Zealand in promoting human rights and democracy in the rules-based international order. And actually, this has only grown over the last couple of years, and in particular over the last nine months, but I'll come to that in a minute. Second, and maybe first, 
So these are in no particular order. To promote the EU's leadership for the green transition, the European Union's Green Deal and the EU's goal to be the world's first climate neutral continent by 2050. To support the free trade agreement negotiations. And fourth, but not last, strengthen and create connections between our societies wherever of interest to both of us, the classic ambassadorial job. When I arrived end of November, I had a brief spell of normality in December and January, and then came the pandemic. And with it, EU repatriation flights, frenzied uh, attempts at bringing 20,000 EU citizens uh, back home, common experiences of lockdown, Zoom diplomacy, and for two years, online trade negotiations that we managed to conclude. Um, despite the difficult circumstances with toddlers around the uh, legs of the EU negotiators. Um, whilst 2020 and 2021 were disruptive years in many aspects, these priorities remained valid for me and my work here and my team's work here. In 2022, New Zealand has been reconnecting with Europe and the world and the highlight for me was the visit of Prime Minister Ardern to Brussels and her meeting with President von der Leyen. More about its outcome a little while later. The EU and New Zealand have been partners throughout this challenging time and our partnership continues to grow as we continue to face turbulent times. However, the world has changed around us. We thought we were just recovering from the pandemic, but on 24th of February, recovery became an illusion. War returned to Europe. Innocent civilians in Ukraine are falling victim to daily shellings. And in recent days, with the targeting of civilian infrastructure, such as electricity, gas, and water supplies, plunging half of Ukraine into darkness. On top of this, supply chains globally are disrupted. Again, parts of the world are facing a food security crisis and the effects of climate change are violently manifest again and again in Europe, but also in Pakistan and closer to here, Nelson. Talk of a poly crisis is not exaggerated. Now, how does the EU, how do we respond together with New Zealand in these turbulent times? I would like to outline three main themes of our partnership. Theme one. EU and New Zealand standing up against Russia's war in Ukraine and defending the rules-based international order. Also here in the region, in the Indo-Pacific. It is evident to everybody that the world is not the same as in 2019. Geopolitics is everywhere and geopolitical considerations seem to determine actions and policies of the major actors more than at any time since the end of the Cold War. Or, as Prime Minister Ardern so eloquently put it in her lecture in, I think it was in July, at the Lowy Institute, the world is bloody messy. The most brutal expression of that is Russia's attack on Ukraine, which shows us what happens when international law is violated, when human rights are breached, free speech is suppressed, and when one nation's democratic aspirations are crushed by an authoritarian neighbor. And as Aotearoa New Zealand recognized immediately, this is not just an in invasion. And I was personally very much um, impressed with the sensitive antennas of New Zealand when it comes to any frictions in the multilateral order. Already in December, I had my first conversation in MFAD when a task force was already being set up, whilst in Europe we were still discussing whether this invasion would really start, uh, take place or not. New Zealand immediately recognized that a war waged by one member of the permanent five members of the UN Security Council is a fundamental challenge to the rules-based international order and shared um, the, the strong feeling and conviction uh, with us that might cannot become right. And as I recall the ongoing war in Europe, I acknowledge New Zealand's solidarity, which was swift and unprecedented. Military, legal, financial aid to uh, Ukraine and, of course, the coordination at the United Nations. Votes at the UN General Assembly have repeatedly demonstrated the global community's repudiation of Russia's war with vast majorities. However, 
and I think this gives us all a lot to think about. Beyond the 27 member states of the European Union, only 14 more have instigated sanctions against Russia. That is far from the majority of the world population. But Aotearoa New Zealand is among those. For the first time in its history, without a Security Council mandate, has imposed sanctions, sanctions against Russia in record time. Many, many thanks for that. Europe can count on New Zealand. That has been made abundantly clear with this reaction, and not for the first time, I should say, um, to the uh, war in Ukraine. And New Zealand can count on Europe. And uh, one testament to this um, mutual understanding was Europe Day. Europe Day, the anniversary of the Schuman Declaration by then French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman. We celebrated on the 9th of May, and obviously this year, just three months after the war broke out, we dedicated it to Ukraine. And without not, not much more than a month's notice, we held a concert with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra in support of Ukraine in Wellington Cathedral. And NZSO willingly and freely gave their skill in support of a country far, far away, and in support of two orchestra members who are themselves Ukrainian. We had a packed audience. People were eager to be there and to be able to show that they are doing something even though they are very, very far away from this horrible war. We in the European Union are friends and partners with Aotearoa New Zealand because we hold common values. We have a shared belief in universal human rights, democracy, multilateralism and rule of law. And when these values are under attack, as they are now in our immediate neighborhood, shockingly in our continent, we stand together. Like-mindedness is not just a word. Rising tensions in the Indo-Pacific region show that defending the rules-based international order is equally important closer to New Zealand's home. The region, and I'm speaking of the Indo-Pacific here, and there, I know there are some among the audience that know much more about the Indo-Pacific than I do, and the region, and it's, uh, its growing economic, demographic, and political weight makes it a key player in shaping the rules-based international order and in addressing global challenges. And also here in the Pacific, the EU and New Zealand are partners. And I'll quote Prime Minister Ardern again and her speech at the Lowy Institute. In the face of rising tensions in the region, she said that as New Zealand looks to the wider Indo-Pacific, we seek to ensure that the intensity of our engagement is increasing and we call for others to do the same. The EU has been present in the Pacific for a long time. But we also realize that this is becoming a more contested space. And we've adopted our own strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And it's really important to highlight or to put the emphasis on cooperation because our strategy is an invitation for uh, cooperation. And it's a very comprehensive um, strategy. We're stepping up our engagement and our contribution to stability, prosperity, and sustainable development in the region in line with the principles of democracy, rule of law, human rights, and international law, just as New Zealand has been doing for so many years. Yet, geopolitical competition should not distract us from what Pacific countries themselves have named loud and clear as their top concern, and only very recently, two weeks ago in Sharm el Sheikh. Climate change. Many here today will know that climate action is the EU's short, medium, and long-term objective uh, via the European Green Deal. We have an ambitious response, and again, this is a fight we cannot win alone. Theme two, which brings me to theme two, New Zealand and the EU as partners on climate. Regardless of recent turbulence and ongoing turbulence, the European Union is committed to the green transition, now more than ever. And um, I cannot say it often enough because I've read um, a lot also here in the press that, ah, these coal plants that get fired up in Europe, um, are you um, uh, basically farewelling your green transition? No, we are not. We're not. Um, the war has not dampened our climate ambitions. On the contrary, it has accelerated them because we needed to get rid of fossil fuels even quicker than we thought we had to. 
um, our dependence from Russian fossil fuels, and in particular from gas, was 40%. 40% of our gas uh, we imported from Russia on the 24th of February. Today, we're importing 9% of our gas from uh, Russia. So we're well on the path to end dependency on Russian fossil fuels. Remember, last time this year, such a leap would have been thought an impossibility. And this is where sustainability meets solidarity. You will have also seen the EU's commitment to climate action two weeks ago at COP27. That was a tough week. And I think um, you will have heard in the, in the closing speech of uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans, who is in charge of, um, of climate action at the European Commission, that it wasn't the result we had hoped for. The EU stayed strong on mitigation. And we nearly walked away because we thought the deal was not good enough. Such is our frustration at the lack of commitment by the world's major emitters to phase down, or rather out, which seems to be the more um, apt um, description of what our commitments should be, fossil fuels, nor make new commitments on climate mitigation. However, the EU is a bridge builder between donors and vulnerable communities. And we helped together with New Zealand. And once again, New Zealand did what it is excellent at. It, um, it provided um, momentum to a discussion by pledging $20 million for the loss and damage, the new loss and damage fund. And that helped move, uh, move the dial, um, if not decisively, then at least uh, to, to a great in, um, extent. And um, together with New Zealand, we pushed uh, for this to put in place a balanced new funding arrangement which, uh, with an expanded um, donor base to help vulnerable communities. We have made some progress to face the loss and damage caused by climate change. And um, you might have seen that in the final stages of the, of the COP negotiations, um, our negotiators tweeted about the photos they had with, uh, with the countries that were involved in these last ditch attempts at saving a deal that everybody could leave with. So they were meeting with the US, um, they were meeting with India, and guess who else they met with? New Zealand, of course, because New Zealand is, um, yeah, is a country that, as um, the uh, Director General of the WTO only said, uh, said this week, and I know um, uh, it's been said frequently, but it can't be said often enough, punching above its weight. And your negotiators, and one of them is actually sitting here among the audience, your <laughs> negotiators are exceptionally, exceptionally skilled. And exactly these bridge building um, uh, qualities coming from a country that is more dependent than many other countries on uh, multilateralism that is alive and kicking um, is really cherished um, by, by the European Union. However, so much more needs to be done to keep the planet livable. As with Russia's war on Ukraine, climate effects are borne thousands of kilometers from their cause. There are food crises in the global south caused by fertilizer price hikes. So too is the global south ill-equipped to rebuild and restore infrastructure after extreme weather events. As President von der Leyen said at the conclusion of COP27, we've treated some of the symptoms but not cured the patient from its fever. And you know, she's a former doctor, so she knows what she's talking about. Yeah, we have a shared responsibility to the planet to meet our Paris targets on adaptation, on loss and damage. Hats off to the New Zealand negotiators, not only for the loss and damage push, but also for the important contribution to completing the Paris rule book. Rule book. The EU is a big block, and we take a bigger responsibility. Just to illustrate, the EU is the world's number one climate finance partner with uh, 27 billion US dollars contributed in climate finance only last year. But New Zealand has also stepped up its commitments with a quadrupling of its climate finance and a strong focus on the Pacific. So partners also in climate action, one of the outcomes from the meeting between uh, Prime Minister Ardern and President von der Leyen at the end of June. And there is a, uh, is, is a commitment to deepen and elevate the status of bilateral dialogue and cooperation on climate change. We can do more together. 
This doesn't mean we're not doing a lot already, and I'll just give you a couple of examples where we are partnering with New Zealand and, and learning from each other. We've started to establish um, city training partnerships between New Plymouth and Vilnius in Lithuania, between Nelson Wakatu and Lemvi in Denmark, and between Christchurch and Malaga, Vitoria, Gasteiz. And they are talking about green spaces, waste, and mobility funded by the European Union. And they'll be um, visiting uh, each other this year. So some visits have already taken place. It's a global program, and last year reached Aotearoa. We are also working towards common goals in the Pacific, in renewable energy projects in Kiribati, the Cook Islands, Samoa, and Tuvalu. And we are together with France, Canada, Australia, and Aotearoa, are working on adaptation to boost biodiversity and strengthen resilience across the Pacific in the Kiwa Initiative. And of course, when it comes to reducing agricultural emissions, <laughs> New Zealand's research is cutting edge. Which brings me to theme number three, agriculture. So what do you guess is the third theme? <laughs> EU and New Zealand partners for a brighter future ahead. And I'll be talking about the free trade agreement. The conclusion of free trade negotiations this year is a tremendous achievement and the biggest step in EU-New Zealand relations uh, for a long time. Undeniably, the EU FTA with New Zealand is set within the context of global turbulence and I've already talked about this at length, but New Zealand's commitment to building the rules-based, building, maintaining and expanding the rules-based global trading system is well known and recognized as exemplified with the visit by the Director General of the WTO who made the long way to visit Australia and, um, and some Pacific uh, countries and New Zealand. She said, yes, New Zealand is a small country, but it punches above its weight consistently and is listened to. But um, on the substance of her visit, and I think that, is, um, that cannot be underlined um, enough, is that I think we both share, the EU and New Zealand share the Director General's view that trade is also an essential part of a just and ambitious response to climate change, since it is vital for diffusing green technology cutting the cost of getting to net zero and helping countries mitigate and adapt. In our FTA, the EU and New Zealand's response to the existential challenge of climate change and to the turbulence in the world is definitely progressive and ambitious. And we go beyond, much beyond market access, which is not to say that market access is not addressed. 91% of New Zealand's current goods trade to the EU will enter duty-free from day one, rising to 97% after seven years. That is not nothing, even as I acknowledge that your meat and dairy sectors hope for more. Ours hope for less. <laughs> We're looking to the future, towards what high income, discerning European customers want and New Zealand producers can provide. The texts in the agreed deal with New Zealand on sustainability set a gold standard for EU FTAs. And you should have seen 30th of June in Brussels, uh, the day the negotiations um, were concluded. It was like a ray of sunshine in Brussels corridors, just walking and talking to colleagues in, that were very much in, an, in, an, in a period of gloom with the war dragging on and, 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 um, and just energy prices going up, food prices going up. And there was a positive sign, a sign in support of the a global um, trading system, so people were very happy. And we set a new gold standard, a new international benchmark in the nexus of trade and sustainability, the first of a new generation of green and just trade deals, reflecting the high ambition of both parties on these issues. On climate, the agreement commits the EU and New Zealand to effectively implement the Paris Agreement and to work together on climate-related matters, including carbon pricing and the transition to a low-carbon economy. It has been the case in agreements before that the trade and sustainable development uh, commitments are, of course, legally binding. They're part of an agreement and enforceable. However, the deal with, that we've concluded with New Zealand is the first of its kind to include sanctions as a matter of last resort in instances of serious violations of core uh, trade and sustainable development commitments. Which means we've both 
um, acknowledged that climate ambition trumps trade interests if necessary, if there is a problem. Also beyond the trade and sustainable um, development provisions, it's a modern comprehensive agreement with many more FTA firsts, some of which are a first ever indigenous chapter in an EU free trade agreement, the Maori Trade and Economic Cooperation chapter. Uh, it uh, identifies areas to develop business links between Maori and EU enterprises uh, to extract the full benefits from the FTA and right across the FTA um, we share the aim to promote and protect Maori rights and interests. We've also got a first ever chapter on sustainable food systems, cooperation on food systems issues like production methods and practices and the environmental and climate impacts of food production. Now you might ask, and when will we all be able to benefit from this? So I'll, I thought I'll say two words on the time frame. The importance of this deal is well understood um, in Brussels, and already in September, we had a visit from the International Trade Committee um, of the European Parliament. And they were particularly interested to hear what New Zealand civil society had to say about the FTA, not just government and business groups. The social license for trade is always on our mind, as we know is the case also here. Civil society has a prominent role in the implementation of the Free Trade Agreement and the International Trade Committee is sensitive to the voices of civil society and this will not end at ratification but is an ongoing mandate. Our respective teams have just completed the legal revision in record speed, which was a key milestone in order to be able to keep up with the ambitious timeline we've set ourselves. Both Prime Minister Ardern and President von der Leyen have a shared goal to sign the agreement in the middle of 2023, which would set a timer to enter into force in 2024. These significant achievements and the partnership in these three main areas are accompanied by lots of other um, areas of cooperation and lots of contacts between Brussels and Wellington on issues such as digital, agriculture, health and security. I'd like to flag just one more area where we are um, looking to step up our cooperation, and that is in the area of research. Um, greater research collaboration um, is very likely to happen in the near future via Horizon Europe, which is the EU's and at the same time the world's largest research platform with a budget of 170 billion New Zealand dollars over seven years. And even in the week leading up to Christmas, um, quite a joy for my team uh, here <laughs> in Wellington. The colleagues, the negotiators from Brussels, from uh, the research uh, director general, will be coming to Wellington to work with MB to pin this down. Research is obviously an area where Kiwi ingenuity meets Europe's scale and strategy, so very much looking forward to um, intensifying our cooperation on that. All this cooperation on the areas I've talked about tonight, our shared values, climate action and, and trade, is underpinned by our shared concerns for the well-being and prosperity of our peoples and for the rest of the world. While there's turbulence around the European Union, the EU responds by reaching for and reasserting its core values. In keeping with its nature, the EU does not do this alone, but seeks friends who share these core values, as New Zealand does. By bringing together the strengths of Aotearoa and the new European Union, we make a partnership for the long term, one that endures and opens new doors, and that ultimately benefits our peoples. Nga mi nui, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. I'll go sit down now. Take your questions sitting down. Kia ora koutou. Um, six languages. <laughs> I speak one badly and another one almost non-existent. So uh, look, it's a great uh, honour here to be here this evening uh, with you all. And thank you, Ambassador, for inviting me uh, to come along to this evening, when you first invited me, I have to say I was a little surprised. In fact, I think I asked you three times uh, whether you got the right person. 
I wondered if you thought I was wearing an old hat, uh, one that my wife still wears, but I don't. Uh, but you told me that this was the hat you wanted me to wear, and I, I have to admit, when I, when I heard your speech this evening, I was rather relieved that I could see where, this, where, where I would fit in. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of uh, the Sustainable Business Council. We're an organisation of about 135 companies, about a third of New Zealand's GDP wrapped up in those companies. And uh, the, these are very ambitious companies that really want to drive sustainability and make New Zealand a better place to live and thrive and ensure that we've got a sustainable future for all of us. And I'm often asked why it is that New Zealand businesses even have an interest in taking action on climate or building a green economy. And so building off what the ambassador just talked about, really it comes down to three things from a business perspective. The first of those is it's actually the right thing to do. Believe it or not, businesses are made up of people as well. And those people believe that taking action on this is the right thing to do. It motivates them, motivates their shareholders, motivates their business and motivates their boards and people. And when we look at uh, international surveys and particularly domestic surveys, we see that this is true. More and more companies think that this is the right thing to do and that's why they're taking action. Second, it's good business to take action on sustainability. Sustainability in many ways is just another word for foresight. It's about looking ahead, it's about extending your time horizons and looking out. And it turns out that when you look at the research, if you extend your time horizons and you think ahead, not only do you scout for risks, you also scout for opportunities and you do better as a company. And on a practical level, that's already showing itself up in the bottom line of many companies and that's why we're seeing internationally and here in New Zealand, companies moving more and more towards sustainability. A 2020 World Economic Forum uh, report noted that a restorative and regenerative economy can potentially unlock $4.5 trillion in growth, reduce CO2 emissions by 45% and waste by a further 90%. That is not an insignificant amount of action. And the third reason for doing it is that the risks are real and significant, both in terms of material risks to business from climate change and other environmental challenges, and the competitive risk of falling behind in what is a fast emerging trend in consumer demand and investor priority. The international context is moving rapidly as boards, executives and investors realise the scale and the immediacy of the challenge and begin to prioritise the allocation of capital into climate action and sustainability action. And I've just come back from uh, an event in, in Japan and uh, with, with our, our global organisation, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And that just runs off the tongue, doesn't it? And um, what was really interesting about that, that's composed of around 230 of the world's largest companies, so 10% of emissions wrapped up in that room, of the globe's emissions. And what I was really impressed by was the significant amount of resource allocation and capital allocation happening at pace by these companies. Why? They're spooked. They're genuinely worried by what is happening. Those reports are beginning to filter through. People are seeing what is actually happening and they're wanting to take action on it. So that's the, the, the mood of the boardroom, that's where things are going globally. And so if New Zealand doesn't move on these things, we really uh, risk being left behind. So it's really reassuring for those of us focused on climate and sustainability to hear what the ambassador has just said around the EU's commitment in these extremely challenging times to accelerating action on climate and sustainability, and that actually you're picking up pace. And in fact, it sounds like in some respects it may have even strengthened your resolve rather than weakening it. So I'd really start to start my question, I suppose, this evening. I'm going to sit down. It sounds a wee, it's a wee bit crude. Um, but most importantly, of course, and the reason why we're all here is um, to th I need to thank Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer for your address this evening. Um, can we all show Nina our appreciation?